welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be back uh, doing another live stream here. My name is Zach Dunham. I'm here with Bantam Tools, and I'm joined today by Graham Goodier from Autodesk. Uh, Graham, what's up? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, nice to be here. Like, yeah, I'm looking, looking forward to it. Um, so obviously, if you signed up for this, you know a little bit about Bantam Tools. Um, we recently just launched this uh, desktop CNC milling machine, and um, one of the things you know that we hear a lot from people is you know, they want to get into CNC, they've got a background maybe in 3D printing. Um, I've gone through the getting started projects for your, you know, for your machine. Um, and I've got this idea for a part that I want to make. And how do I go from idea to finished, you know, machines part or, um, yeah, what are the what are the steps? And a big part of the learning curve for people ends up being the CAD CAM workflow. Um, and it, I will say that as a, you know, relative, you know, two years under my belt kind of beginner, um, it's, uh, it's not impossible, but there are uh, literally lots of boxes to check in the process of, of setting up a part, whether it's CAD or CAM. And um, so today, what we're hoping to do and um, to continue as well um, is to kick off an educational series with Autodesk. Um, this is part one of the series where we're going to be going through CAD. Uh, part two is going to be in two weeks um, on Wednesday, the, is it the 13th? Um, we'll post a link. I've got to pull up the calendar. Um, we'll post a link in the chat. Um, but that that um, that session is going to focus on CAM. So mostly today, Graham's going to be taking us through Fusion. Um, we've got a chat going on the right, so drop um, drop your questions in the chat, and I will uh, try my best um, as well to uh, stop Graham when when he's you know on something really juicy, and, and we can get some more details. Um, Sean says, so is this just a CAD session? This is mostly a CAD session. We'll probably touch on some CAM stuff, but Graham's going to be doing a CAD, um, a CAD demo primarily. And in the next session, he's going to be doing a CAM demo. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I would say, uh, Graham, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Um, well, like you say, we'll, we'll, we'll lean into some of the CAD, uh, CAM stuff. So if you have some CAM-related questions to CAD, we, we can kind of touch on those. So I'll uh, yeah, share my screen. Um, it's although it's for some yeah. reason let me share my PowerPoint for some reason. No. Let's check this off. Here we go. Sorry about that. So yeah, this is a little bit about today is just again just talking through a little bit basically about how we can sort of design for CNC and how if you sort of enter in this CAD world of CAD and CAM, how we can make a really good introduction to it with Fusion 360 and, and, and Bantam Tools. Um, so just a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. And um, we'll talk first of all about the sort of challenges for CAD users and sort of what are the, the front end problems of what we need to think about before we start programming any parts and start producing some nice cut parts on the machine tools. Um, but yeah, and then we'll talk a bit about basically how those parts are programmed themselves, why Fusion 360 and why it's a little bit different. I'll talk through a, a short demo of basically of how Fusion 360 works and how CAD works in Fusion. A few things we need to consider in terms of our design for manufacturing, a little bit of an introduction to tooling that we have in Fusion and that we have available uh, as well, and the uh, manufacturing con uh, considerations as well we need to think about. Um, and then finally, I'll touch on a little bit of rendering as well, just to so show you some nice um, some sparkly images as well you can produce in Fusion. And we'll end that with a little bit of Q&A so you guys can just throw some questions my way. But but like Zach said before, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we'll, we'll stop um, regularly to, to answer those questions for you. And uh, a couple of people are asking, can you share the deck and share a recording? Yes, we will be, we'll be, we'll be sharing a recording of this um, later this evening, most likely. So, all right, awesome. Graham. So yeah, just a little bit about me before we get started. As you can probably tell by my accent, um, I'm based from the UK. Uh, I'm a technical consultant at Autodesk, and I've been working uh, here for about five years now. And I'm uh, a self-described Fusion 360 expert, but you'll, you'll soon be the judge, you know. Um, and I'm a sort of regular user of CNC machinery and also CAD as well, Not, um, primarily obviously Fusion 360. Uh, and I, but I travel regularly between the United States and, and Europe for these kind of Fusion-related events. Unfortunately, because of COVID, I haven't been able to do that, but uh, I hope to be stateside with you guys at some point uh, very soon. So that's just a little bit about my background and, and uh, who I am. So, so we'll just jump right into it and we'll jump into the sort of challenges for CAD users um, uh, in some modern day. So the real sort of challenges for CAD users are that uh, oftentimes we have 
anytime we want to make a change in our design, we need to start to kind of import export constantly with traditional CAD software. And what we end up getting is basically you have sort of version one, two, three, and four and, and clogging up our, our software. And we, what we really like is the real time changes between our CAD and our CAM software. And also that our geometry relationships are just purely dimensional. So we, instead of instead of having sort of certain relationships between uh, say lines, squares, circles, you name it, it's predominantly we can end up having just dimensions which can just crowd your space and get too much in the way. And, and we want to look past that and just focus on actually creating a design. Uh, and furthermore, because of COVID, as we all know, you know, collaborating between teams can be very difficult. Um, and if we're making changes, particularly if we have a, 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 a version on our own computers, it's then quite hard to say, go back and say, uh, my colleague might have made a change and I've made a change. We try both try and say, look, this is what I've done. And you end up with different versions, of different points. And we're essentially working against each other that way. And that's that's not what we want. Um, and, and next up is CAM considerations. At the end of the day, we're here to make things, you know, and that some designers, you know, if you're new to CAD especially, you might not be aware of certain things you have to take into account before manufacturing something. So we'll look a little bit about the um, constraints required for a design and how that will impact you. And then finally, the CAD users often have to have, they often have to learn different sort of CAD and CAM softwares. And we'll show you really with Fusion and Bansom how that truck, how the two could be uh, made very quick and easy. So we'll start quickly just with sort of how a part is programmed and how basically how that sort of CAD to CAM to manufacture process takes place. So what we do is we start with our CAD model where we either make, design something ourselves or we might actually import a part that someone else has given us. We take a stock bit of material, which is the actual bit of say of metal or wood that we're going to cut and determine the part size. And from that, we'll create what's called a setup. So basically determine, you know, where the machine tool is going to reference a sort of single point on the machine tool so it knows exactly where to cut our individual part. And from that, we'll specify our tools and machine parameters. We'll look at creating some tool paths. We'll simulate it because we want it to be safe and also we don't want to break any tools. You never want to do that, trust me. We've all done it, but it's, it's never, never useful. <laughs> Um, and then we'll uh, and then we'll finish by outputting our NC code using our post processor, which basically translates our information from the CAD CAM software into basically what the machine tool knows how to cut something. So just to give you a little bit of background about what Fusion is from a sort of human standpoint, um, we're just going to show you a short video about basically what Fusion 360 is and what it's capable of. So uh, Zach, if you want to play the sort of first video for us. Yeah, sure. And let me turn down the volume. I think this one has a dramatic intro. It does, yeah. <laughs> okay. We're trying to do something that's never been done before. Something that seemed impossible. We are constantly trying to push our designs just a little bit further. I'm always saying, make it even better. Before I had Fusion 360, the question was, can I really make that? Now it's more like, what can't I make? Now I have a simple way to solve really complicated problems. Starting a project used to be so daunting. We'd spend days trying to make a prototype. I love how intuitive the software feels. It's like an extension of my brain. Our team is really tight knit, even though we have people all over the world. Fusion 360 keeps us connected. I'm able to spend more time with the things that matter to me most because I can get my work done anytime, anywhere. It's an amazing feeling to hold something you've brought from idea to reality. With Fusion 360, I don't have compromise between cost or quality. I'm an engineer. I'm a machinist. I'm a designer. And I use Fusion 360. Fusion 360. One product. Unlimited possibilities. Yes, yeah, so that's a very sort of nice, simple way of kind of 
justifying what Fusion 360 is, basically what the potential could be, but also it's the idea that you can take these designs and, and bring them to, to real life through an easy process. You know, it doesn't have to be whether it's something complex or futuristic or whether it's just, you know, we, we want to prototype something on a hobbyist level, you know, it's it's whether you're designing something um, abstract. I mean, I, I even actually designed my apartment on, on Fusion 360 or whether you want to, uh, if you want to machine these simple things for um, home use prototyping, whatever that might be, it doesn't have to be, you know, this high level. And I think that's the great thing about what Fusion is. But also, like it's mentioned about, is keeping us connected, especially during these times of COVID. Using the cloud collaboration tools, it's really useful, say, for me and, and say, colleagues even in the United States, in Asia, in, in Australasia, wherever that may be over, over the globe, you know, I can collaborate with them using the cloud tools available within Fusion 360. And it's, it's a uh, very well-rounded solution to basically all of your design and manufacturing needs. Hey, Graham, as you jump back into the... Um into the presentation, um, one of the one of the questions that just came up um, from Michael mm -hmm. is saying, is the personal edition good enough for everything that we're going to do? I assume that he means personal edition of Fusion for everything that we're gonna be doing on the Bantam Tools desktop CNC mailing machine. Could you talk a little bit about um, the, the sort of tiers and um, for people that are just getting started, is the personal edition um, fully featured? Yeah, well, yeah, so it's, it depends. It basically depends on what you're doing and basically what you're making. So we we allow sort of personal editions and hobbyist editions for people make. I think making under I think a hundred thousand dollars a year of turnover. I, I, I would have to get back to you on the specific figure for that. Sure. So those are, those are the licenses we allow below that level. Gotcha. After that level, it's it's a it's a commercial license which is a about four hundred ninety five dollars a year. No kind of no strings attached. You know you don't have to sign up to loads of different things. It's just a annual rate four nine five dollars a year. Yeah, it's, <laughs> very good value of money considering obviously the other solutions sure. but also if, you, if you're a student as well and you're thinking about getting a cnc machine tool we offer if you're a, if you have any kind of educational uh, email address and you're a student that wants to get into this kind of thing we offer students all students uh, the software for free as well so you can really just kind of get to grips with the, uh, design and manufacturing without having to worry about the costs of the the software instead of focusing on buying that machine tool and obviously creating some parts and like we were talking about before making things you know cool. so awesome yeah so how Fusion is different, obviously, it takes into account basically lots of different parts of the design and manufacturing process, for instance, even the initial scope and design. Hey, programming. Yeah. One, one quick thing. Could you um, hit the screen share again, um, just after oh, that video played? Sorry, my, on mine it says it's still sharing. Sorry, I apologize for that. No problem. Um, so Michael, I think the answer to that question is, uh, so long as you're um, using this for personal use um, and you're not, uh, not already knocking it out of the park with your business, that um, you're good to go with that one. Yeah, like we, we want to help startups, but we, yeah, we obviously we still need to make some money at the end of the day. Of course, of course, <laughs> um, of course. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about obviously how Fusion is different. We take that initial design, you know, we can program tool paths in there. We obviously get it onto our machine tools. We can simulate, we can you know, use probing things. It's taking into account the whole design and manufacturing process. It has lots of different facets as well. And we'll probably explore that more in our sort of second parts of the of this series as well. Um, but we'll really kind of get down to brass taxes and talk about what we sort of need to consider with our when we're looking at CAD. And there's a few things we need to take into account. And that whilst it's great, we want to we've got this great design, we want to make it. The thing is, is that we need to make sure, for example, that a, a tool can actually access all areas of the part. You know, if, if I'm cutting in with say in three axes, I won't be able to say rotate my tool around and start machining the sides. I need to make sure that my actual tool can access those areas. So if the, uh, examples include if you wanted a say a hard internal corner that was just a right angle corner, we have to, we're uh, machining with circular tools. It's going to produce a, a radius on the inside of there. So when we're designing, we need to make sure that our tools will fit inside those internal radii. We need to make sure that the tools we've got, the flute length, which is the cutting length of the tool, um, must be more than depth of cuts because we don't want to basically machine try and cut with a non cutting part of the tool. And we'll touch on why that's very important in a sec. Um, and the, the tool at the end of the day must be able to enter it safely. We don't want to break a machine. It can be expensive. You don't have to repair it. Like I said earlier, you don't want to break any tools and, and have to wait just to get more in. Um, and also the holder mustn't collide with the part as well. We also need to make sure that a part is the correct size of the machine. You know, if I'm, you know, I've got this huge design and I'm trying to fit it in my new Bantam desktop CNC, it's, you know, not going to fit in there. I need to check if my machining space is big enough. And also with the part that I've got, um, whether basically the geometry that I've got could be machined. It could be this really free form, artistic, amazing design. And whilst that is fantastic, it, it might not just, it just might not be machinable. 
And with that, we'll kind of have a look at sort of introduction to tooling and the types of tools that are available. So some of you might be familiar to this and some of you might not, but, but these are the sort of two main types of tool that we cut with on a CNC machine. So the first is a flat end one, where we, we use it primarily for roughing strategies. And by roughing, we essentially get rid of that excess material. We just need to get that out of there as quickly as possible. So we want to basically clear that away. And what we end up with is geometry like this, these sort of little steps or stairs. Um, and that's the geometry you'll get if we look at a sort of cross section of a part. We also have a ball nose end mill as well, where we get this sort of round end geometry. And this is used primarily, primarily for finishing operations. So what we would do is, is we would have smaller step overs and a step over the distance between the machining pass, between these uh, two um, machining passes. And what we'd eventually get is this really sort of nice, sort of soft um, freeform geometry we could get from that as opposed to these little spiky cusps. So it, both of these can be used for roughing and or finishing. It just, it just depends on what operation you're using. And again, we'll touch on this more in our sort of second part of the series. But when designing, these are the kinds of types of tool that we have available to us. So that if we were machining any um, uh, any tapers, we could use this sort of tapered end mill, which gives us a nice sort of angle surface. Or if we're machining in three axis, we want to machine the sides without having to rotate the part. We could use a slot mill, a dovetail mill, a lollipop cutter, that kind of thing. And whether if we want to machine uh, use, machine some threads, so if you want to be able to screw anything in into a part, uh, the Banton uh, desktop CNC allows us to use these thread mills to really quickly and easily create these standard threads um, on our parts uh, as well. And I, I, you guys know what a drill is, that kind of thing as well. I get all of these available within Fusion 360, uh, but obviously it's something to, to think about and explore when, when thinking about what your design might look like. And there's a few different lengths and things we have to consider with our design. So I won't go into all of these because there's quite a lot here. But like, as I mentioned before, the main ones really are they say, the overall length, and that's the total length of the tool that's outside the holder, and the flute length. We want to make sure that this holder here doesn't collide with our part when our tool comes down and starts machining our part itself, because that can damage the machine and the part. But also this flute here, which is the cussing part of the tool, we want to make sure that, that part is actually cussing metal as opposed to, let's say, the shoulder length plus the flute length. Because as you can see here, where there's no cutting part of, of the tool, what we're going to get probably is a lot of sparks, a lot of friction, a lot of heat, and most likely a broken tool. So I'm going to show you a couple of different examples of what poor design would look like in a man when uh, taking into account manufacturing considerations. So Zach, if we could just play the three uh, videos of what sort of poor design might look like. No problem. All right, poor design video number one. So this one's here, basically, if, the, if your diameter of the tool is too big, we can't actually cut these internal radii, as you can see here. So whilst it might look like from the human eye, we can see, oh, it looks, you know, it's, it's clearing the space that I wanted to clear, great. But as soon as we actually find it dig a little deeper and we zoom in a little bit, we can see from using this um, tool in Fusion 360, the comparison tool, where the blue denotes basically excess material, because our diameter is too big, we can't cut that, that, that small part there, which you can imagine, especially for holes, it is not ideal for us. So we could measure the dimension. We can make sure, OK, this is the size of our tool. And let's say in this case, um, it, it, was, it was a half an inch end mill. If my corner here is actually the same as half an inch as well, it's all it's going to do is kind of machine to the end and sharply go down. So what I want to do is choose a tool which is a little bit larger than that internal radius. So instead of getting these hard edge tool paths, I get a little bit more of a sweep. So that way, if it kind of sweeps around, we get that better surface finish. So when you can see here, as we kind of cut this part here, it's managed to then cut away this part, uh, this, this radii here, with no, extra, no additional lath material. Yeah, I can say that the comparison tool in um, the Fusion 360 simulation is a great, great thing to always remember to check. All right, video number two here. So this is a really good example of basically when our, our flute length uh, is too short. So you can see it's hard to see from this red, but this red basically shows when, when basically something bad is happening in Fusion, when it's gouging. So you can see the dark gray here and the light gray. It's fine for these edges here because obviously the flute length can cut, it is low enough to cut those edges. As soon as I start machining these parts here, though, obviously that's glowing red and Fusion is telling us, yeah, this something isn't good. The nice thing, though, about Fusion 360 is that it will automatically know these lengths and will warn you beforehand to say, 
this is the maximum flute length. You know, you're about to cut below, uh, cut the uh, cut basically without the flute length. Um, are you sure you want to go ahead? So it's a nice check and balance before you do that. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Like, you don't. It's not as if every time you're setting up a part, you're entering in all of those dimensions to the tool um, that you, that you had in that previous graphic. Once you're using a tool library that's been vetted by a company like Bantam or you know whoever it is, it's Harvey, Helical, Datron. Uh, the simulation is is pulling in that data, right? So absolutely, this yeah. isn't something that the end user is checking. Okay, video three here. And the final one here is when we talk in a similar capacity, talks we're looking more about the, the tool holder here. So now you can see here that the, again our tool and our holder are glowing red, denoting a gouge. You can see whilst we cut the actual area we wanted to cut, if you look at that those top corners, the, the holder had actually removed some parts of that as well. So that's denoting where the holder itself had collided with the the, uh, the part. So. Um, and one thing I'll just say while you switch back over, Graham, is um, yeah, on the Bantam tool CNC, um, one of the things, there's like a sort of second um, level of, of error checking here too. So once you're pulling in that uh, tool path to the machine, the first thing that it does is it touches off the length of the tool that you have installed. And it's going to tell you, hey, with the tool that you have you know, in there, you, you potentially you're going to machine into the bed or you're going to cause a frame collision or you're going to cause it to retract too far. So there's a sort of second level of, of error checking for these as well. Absolutely. So just to check, can, can you see my screen being shared at the moment? Yep. OK, cool. So I'll just carry on. Oh, some reason showing there. Okay, so do, again, just to summarize, or, uh, there's a nice sort of summary here, but again, really what, what we really need to take into account really is just making sure this overall length and the flute length, we take this into consideration before we start these designs. Or if we've already designed something, then once we come into the manufacturing space, that we then either, or, that we potentially order the correct tools to make sure we can machine this as well. So like, basically what we're trying to say is make sure you check your tool lengths before you start designing something. So I'm going to quickly jump into uh, Fusion 360, and I'll just give you a, sort of a really quick sort of um, demo into uh, CAD within Fusion 360 and what and what sort of we're, we're capable of designing um, quickly and easily, and also how sort of small changes can, with with the right process, can make sure that nothing sort of jumping all over the place and moving it not in a way that you would like. And if we need to edit any dimensions, like we said. If it, you don't have a specific tool and you need to make those changes, how we can make them very quickly and easily. So just uh, to check, Zach, can we? Can you guys see my screen? Good to go. Awesome. Right, so, well, I'll, I'll just uh, hang on in then. So the first thing we want to do within Fusion 360 is uh, create a sketch. And we do this in what's called the design workspace here. So we have lots of different workspaces to, that denote obviously all the, lots of different functionality that Fusion has, but one of the best ones, obviously, design. That's why we're here. So I have to click this top icon here. It's create sketch, and you can see here I've been given these planes to work with. And what's important about these when we're considering designing for manufacturing is that we we've got our so Z axis in blue, our X axis in red, and our green one is our Y axis. And when we're machining, our tool is going to travel in the Z direction. And if you need a reminder, in the top right in the view cube, these are labeled here. If you forget the colors. What that means is that if, if I know my tool is going to approach from this direction, or, uh, vertically, I want to start sketching on this XY plane here. So as soon as I click this flat plane here, it'll automatically look down on exactly what I would like to be sketching on. And the nice thing is it opens this, this sketching grid, which is really useful to be able to use, because if I, say, wanted to create a line here, it'll snap automatically to these grid sections here. I could turn the snap off in this sketch part on the right. So if I want to turn that off. You can see I'm free to uh, create my line anywhere I'd like. But for what we're doing, it's very useful for me to be able to do this. So I can simply click and select a point I want to start from, create the length of the line, click off here, and I've created my line. So that's quite a simplistic way of doing things. If I, say, wanted to change the dimension of my line afterwards, I would have to go to sketch dimension, click here, select this and then select the length of this line like so. I can speed up the process by if I quickly do another line here. So you can see as I'm sort of hovering over these spaces, I've got these dimensions already in place for me. So if I'd like, I can simply type them in 
and I can type in this one here, it'd be three. And you can see as soon as I type that in, there's a little yellow padlock next to it. And that basically means it's going to be fixed at, th uh, th at three inches. So if I try and move this now, no matter what I move this um, cursor, it's always going to be three inches. So if I press enter, you can see automatically I've created this dimension here. So it's a nice, quick and easy way of, of uh, creating lines and, and certain aspects of geometry. Now, I've left these lines there here for a reason. First of all, is that these lines actually aren't going to be part of my design, but I want to use them as reference. So actually, I don't need dimensions for them, so I can simply select these and delete these if I'd like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and press normal slash construction on both of these. And that's going to turn both of these into construction lines, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to create all most of my design in this bottom right here. I'm going to mirror that onto these four quadrants very quickly and easily. So first thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my line and like you see here, look, we've got these, these numerical references on, um, along these grid lines here. It's going to take this cursor and I'm going to put on this so the two here, take it down to about, let's, let's say, let's say two inches there. Okay. And you can see that I haven't pressed anything, so I can just go to here again. And I haven't pressed on anything. As soon as I press escape, I can come off that there. So I've got my two lines here. So just to, just to verify, I've got my two inches here, my two inches there. So I've got these, these two lines very quickly created. The one thing I'm gonna show you what happens is, is you can see these lines here are black, and basically that means that they are constrained. And you can see these little icons here. Those are what are called constraints, and these are available at the top here. So basically if I created a line at an angle here, I haven't got any dimensions on it, I haven't got any constraints on it. If I wanted to constrain this, I could simply click it and I could use, let's say, the horizontal slash vertical constraint. So if I clicked it here, you can see it's automatically made that horizontal because it was closer to horizontal. If I have a line here, it's vertical, or it's closer to vertical, it becomes vertical. So if I, if I select this constraint and delete it, I can click and move this around freely. But you see with this one here, this line, if I click and move this, it doesn't know the dimension, but you can see I've constrained it to the horizontal. So it knows one type of behavior that I'm trying to limit it to. So with these lines here, I've automatically created these perpendicular. But let's see if I throw in a quick chamfer to that here, like so. Okay, so I want to create a chamfer here. I want to quickly trim those lines to basically make it one line. I can go to trim here and quickly cut off the parts that I wanted here. But you can see as soon as I trim these lines, the dimensions have gone. So they've gone from black when I've defined them to blue. So in this case, I can make sure they're horizontal and vertical if I need be, but it already says that they've got these, these behaviors here where it's perpendicular. So you can see I've got this perpendicular constraint, so I know these lines are going to stay where I, I'd like them to be. So just to make sure I can constrain them, I can provide these dimensions like so if I wanted to. So if I wanted to, I could say make this one and a half inch like so. But you can see this line moved, this is stayed differently. So if I wanted to keep the behavior the same, so this 1.5 here, I could open this one, click here, and you can see how it's turned D5. So I press enter. Now, if I move this, as it changes dimension, say it's 1.75, this one will move with it. So we're starting to build up a relationship here already. So now what I'm gonna do, is I'm just going to take these three lines and I create a mirror. I'm going to start, so I've already got this selected. I'm going to use a mirror line, mirror this to here, press OK. And you can see these mirror um, annotations for constraints pop up to basically denote that if I change this 1.5 here to 1.75 again, all of these are now constrained. So you can start to see how this is building up. So if I do this again, and select all these lines. I'm just holding shift while I do this. I can use my second constraint line. This is a second construction line here. And you can see as soon as we've basically created a closed profile, it's turned blue. So I can select this here. So now again, just to show, all this now is moving with what I would like it to move to. If I wanted to create a circle, I can simply select the circle icon up here click and drag in easy as pie create a circle here 
type it in, press enter, and again, I've got this automatic dimension, it's black, it's all constrained, it's all where I would like it to be. So then if I want, would want to extrude this and make it a solid body, I can rotate it, I can select this, I can use the solid tab, select extrude, and then I can extrude it by the distance I would like to raise it by, which is 1.25, and press enter, and I've quickly got a solid body. So Fusion, you can create a sketch any way you like on a flat surface. So I can create a sketch on the bottom here. And using a similar technique, what I'll do is I can create a rectangle like so. I say, well, I'll actually use one just to use the dimensions again. So you can see here, I've got two there, I've got one. So one, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll, use, we'll use one. That's fine. And we can quickly use the modify tools like fillets just to say, select this fillet here, that's be 0.25. And then we can click this other one, it'll also be 0.25 as well. And again, if we change these, they'll change with it. The only thing that won't, obviously you can see here, this line is now beyond this one. So what we might wanna do is create a dimension here. So now if I change this dimension, we're starting to constrain our dimensions more. So Zachary, were you going to say this one? Yeah, I was going to ask two questions. Um, so first, uh, Chandler is asking, is there a reason that you're going to tear on uh, two axes versus the versus a circular pattern? Uh, no, I could I could have used a circular pattern as well. It's just that's that's a personal preference of mine. It's just that's yeah. So you could absolutely use a circular pattern. Cool. And then I think uh, that I'll ask the beginner question. So you did all this in Sketch. You're you're relying on the sort of parametric nature of and and benefit of setting it up that way in, in, in Fusion, um, which is maybe the answer to this question. But you could achieve this same uh, shape by uh, starting with a box, a uh, 3D box, right? In, in Fusion, yeah, and um, and then editing with the uh, modifying with the chamfer feature. Can you just like in in a couple of broad strokes explain why um, long term there's a benefit doing it the way that you showed here? But personally, it's because I think it's a, a sketch is a lot easier to define exactly what it would be. And it, that whilst it might be quite nice if we're creating um, sort of box shapes like this all the time, it's not always going to be the case. We might have a free form say spline here, um, and then if we're creating these kind of geometries and we're say taking sections out as opposed to building them up, it's a lot easier to start from a shell and a sketch and kind of build those up and it means that if we change these dimensions if i was going to change these as we as we kind of go along say if we're manufacturing something like we said before tool can't access that i can simply go into my sketch change that and you can do this with with say the filleting tool as well but it's more that i i find it a lot more easier that way to build up from a so from sketch and particularly because you can reference these dimensions as well i um, mean to other parts of the model so if i was using this sketch here and i was hovering over this one Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, that one also might say D. Yeah, this one says D11. I can type in D11 on another part of the model and reference it there as well. It doesn't have to be in the same sketch. So that's personally cool. another reason why. Awesome. So, so if I just quickly sort of say, go quick, quicker through the, uh, uh, creating some extrusions of these parts here, so create a, another a quick one here, and and then this time instead of using a mirror on a sketch, what I can do is I can go to create. I go to mirror, and then I make sure I choose a feature because this is the feature that I've created here. So I want to select this feature, and then I want to select a mirror plane, which in this case was already there for us, which is the ZY plane. I can press OK. So it means if I go back into here, and the same thing, if I change it to 0 0.4, it'll change that other one to 0 0.4 as well. So you can see that I'm starting to build up this relationship very, very quickly. And like you said, we can use the modify tool to apply fillets in certain places. So if I want to apply, say, a fillet here, all across the park, yeah, I can do just that. And this is a great uh, opportunity to answer another question that we had, which was, can I machine, is it not possible to machine full right angles for an interior feature? Um, not, with, not with circular tools. You, you would probably have to use a process called wire EDM to get uh, those kind of rectangle, those, those sort of hard shaped um, corners. But, it, but in fairness, it's, it's rare that we would need those a lot of the time anyway. Yeah, which is a really cool tool, but not, not what this yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see the fillet tool, I can select different dimensions in the same tools. If I want that to be 0 0.1 here, I can create some really fillets really quickly and easily through that. 
And again, if we're looking through a different angle, I can create a sketch. I can create a simple rectangle, say through here, and, and I will say, just check that my dimensions are correct. That's going to be there. 1.4. Let's say if I want that to be 0.8. You see it quick and easily, no matter what it is. But I mean, what I'm trying to do is leave a bit of a gap here. So you can see I can select this part, but also I can select here as well. So it basically, even though I've done one rectangle, it'll take parts of the model and allow me to extrude it as well. So if I wanted to, I can extrude this through here like so. So I can choose this kind of arbitrary location here, or I can go extent to object and click here. So that means if I select this dimension here, if I was going to change the size of this main body, this has the reference of this face here. So that, that X3 feature has that reference here. So as we, as we would change the model, it would always keep that face as a reference. So when I go back and make any changes, we, it, we wouldn't come into any issues there. So finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a quick sketch. I'm going to make sure I can use another construction line. What I'm going to do is make sure I'm 135 degrees, but I'm two inches away. So I've got this point here. So I'm going to make that construction line again. So I'm actually going to finish the sketch. So you can see I've got this sketch here already for me. I'm going to use like the, what's called the hole wizard. So if I wanted to create a hole with a certain description, I could click this here and I could edit what type of hole it was. So I could say I could make it a counterbore hole and I could change the dimensions. So I could change those, say, to 0.5 here. And as you can see, it's going through the part. Again, we can use the extent to object to make sure it's this surface there. Oh, I've accidentally slipped to that. There. So once I've specified basically what type of hole, if you want it to be tapped, if you want it to be simple, let's get the tapped hole like so. I press OK, and we can really quickly and easily create these holes like so. And we mentioned the, uh, the circular pattern. Click the circular pattern. We want to make sure again it's a feature. So we can select this feature down here. Choose our sort of uh, this part as our axis, change our quantity. And so again, it, uh, this is a good example, say the circular pattern like so. And again, it means if I were to change one of the dimensions on this, say it was like so, it changes all of them. So one of the nice things, I've got my part pretty much where I'd like it to be, but it means if I wanted to, I could go back to a certain dimension, make changes, and it doesn't affect the rest of it. You know, it's not it's not the same as um, it's not the same as other part um, as other softwares. It might you know they might have some issues along the line. I always think of it like Microsoft Word. You know, sometimes when you, you create a table and you think, oh, it will make a difference if I move it here, and everything moves around your document. You know, um, in, in this is why it's kind of better to plan and make sure plan ahead to make sure that if you've got a part like this. Um, you can make changes uh, along the lines so that obviously nothing moves untoward. So even you can, as you can still probably see here, it might be a bit uneven. We could go, so we could go back to this sketch here, and we could say, see what this dimension is there. See what this dimension is here. Specify this one. This is what's called a driven dimension, so I can't change it. When I know if I change it like so. I can even it up and make it nice and even. So that's all I'll show you for now because I think I've kind of it's a sort of very it's a bit of a blitz of a demo. Um, but I think that again the main thing to take away with Fusion is lots of different ways to, to create a model like you said. So if you wanted to to modify something as it, uh, you know so by like you said create and go to a box a cylinder a sphere and go from there. If you feel adventurous a coil you know you could then go and modify it. Um, but yeah the reality is you want to be using sort of more sketching tools more I would I would you know suggest. But if that's where you want to do it. You go ahead. So yeah, that that was awesome. I w I wish that I had that demo two years ago when I was first <laughs> <laughs> first starting to mess around in Fusion. Um, there's another question about tapping. Um, just to be clear, yeah, this machine doesn't support rigid tapping. We use um, to do. Um, yeah, to make threads in a part, we do thread milling. We use a tool that's like a it's called a double angle shank cutter. Um, it's sort of got like a, a V sort of profile and that goes around and it mills both sides of a thread. Um, 
so that's the type of thread milling we use. And yeah, there's no problem running that with uh, with the higher PMs of this spindle, which is a 10K to 28K. Um, and um, I want to just jump in and try and cover a couple of these other questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When's the next demo? The next demo is in two weeks from yesterday. It's going to be... Yeah on the 12th before I said the 13th, it's the 12th yeah. at, at 2 PM. Um, Graham's doing another, another live stream on the 13th. So, um, and we've got some fusion specific questions. Is there a download for Linux? Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I would have, that's me. I have to get back to you on. I'm not hundred percent sure there is for Mac, um, and, and PC. I have to ask about Linux. Yeah. No problem. Um, uh, Michael says, um, will a CNC prompt to change tools if needed? Yes. So if you run a job with, um, like one of the, one of the things I think we're going to show, this is like one of our getting started projects. It's a little, um, it's a, like an EDC pocket knotting tool. You like take some rope, you wrap it around this, you can cinch up bags and things. This takes, um, a handful, this takes a quarter inch, um, end mill and then a, a quarter inch ball end mill. So if you post, um, let's say you've got your adaptive clearing, your contour, your, um, your, your contour pass with the ball end mill. Um, when you, when you post all those files together in fusion, cause you could post just one file, but you, you post all them together, the, the controller will read the T1, T2 and so on and so forth. And so what happens is it's, a, it's, you manually change tools on, on this machine. Um, it will finish that line, that last line, um, that relates to the first tool and then it will retract the spindle and we'll say, Hey, it's time to insert, insert your other tool. This is the other tool that you've said, um, runs with this job. And then it will perform another tool touch off and then go back into machining. So I hope that answers that question. Um, how do you set up to mill both sides of a part top and bottom of a stock? Awesome question. Do you want to, do you want to tackle this one from Chris? Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd say it's, it's, um, Cover on the camera section, but I just say quickly: it's it's you need to basically make sure that you have you have geometry which your part can clamp onto. If you've got this free form structure with lots of squiggly lines on the end, and you do the top part, you think, this is great, it looks amazing. As soon as you turn it over, it has to be clamped somehow. So things like location holes or having sort of like straight edges where you can you can use your work holding or clamps onto is always a beneficial thing. Or cutting what are called soft jaws as well. So essentially machining out the outline geometry of what you're going to make. So just slots in there so you can clamp it nice and easily. And then you can machine that from the other side as well. And again, with these types of machines, it's very easy to do that. And it's very it's a it's very powerful tool to be able to use because so like, at the end of the day most of the time we'll, we'll machine both setups um but again with with the functionality of the bantam tools um um automatic location for setting up those parts it's a really useful tool to be able to easily so yeah i would say chris um i'll drop a link into the chat in a second for um the video for this part and um the, what we what we do is we you machine the first operation, you machine below the actual model, but you still have a bunch of stock on, on the bottom. Then you take the part out, you flip it over. And like Graham was saying, you rely on the automatic probing um, to relocate that part in the machine. And then you mill away that sort of hat that you have. And then at that point, you've got all these exposed surfaces that are known surfaces and you can reprobe to do other sorts of, um, you know, operation three and operation four. Um, uh, Someone's asking, can we get uh, a look at the Bantam Tool software in the CAM demo? Yeah, Graham and I will work on that. I'll, I'll yep. screen share as well, and I can um, I can take people through the um, the software. So as Graham is showing how to post code, I'll jump into the Bantam Tool software and show you that. Um, and stay tuned. We'll do more demos uh, on the machine itself um, outside of these um, Bantam and Autodesk live streams. But um, and then there's. Thanks in the tap question. Got another one. I need to have the precision down to about a mil. Uh, this is a Bantam question. Oh, is there something in Fusion 360 to take out absolute errors, which can be five mil over nine, nine inches of worth length? Okay. So this machine has some, you know, there there's inherent resolution in the lead screw to, to this machine. And so they're asking, is there a way through Fusion to automatically correct for this? That's a really good question. I'm not sure that I know... I don't know how to, certainly don't know how to answer that for you, for Fusion. Yeah, so, so sorry, I'm not, I'm not familiar, it's familiar with inches and things. So you say, just, is it five over nine? What, what was the issue? Um, so five, five mil. So there's five mil. Yeah, there's five mil over nine inches. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's saying, can you can you correct for that in in fusion? Yeah, yeah. There's there's certain tips and tricks, and I think it would take it take a bit to sort of demonstrate how we would go about doing that. But yeah, there's there's certain way there's always certain ways to get around this. If this is the kind of thing you learn through doing sort of CAD and CAM. Is there's, there's usually always a solution. Um, right. So yeah, absolutely. There's ways of sort of changing the size of holes, uh, taking into account. Um, so if you, even if you're measuring your tools, you find it's you know after it's worn down a little bit and you've remeasured it, you can update that in your tool library, for example. That'll change the size of your um, uh, tools when you output your code. It'll all be fine. So with that, so the CAD section, the CAM section, there's always ways of making making some edits to make it work. Cool. Um, there's some uh, more questions on step by step guides. Yes, we will be doing step by step guides. Um, we hope to be doing a lot of step by step guides, especially with the Autodesk team on um, on on this this workflow and, and this type of stuff. So um, Jay, yes, uh, stay tuned. Look look out um, for those things on our blog. Um, what is would it be possible to modify the Vanta mill for some kind of coolant system? Um, this mill isn't really designed for for coolant. You know, I mean, I think that people are going to get this machine. And it's going to be a tool in your basement. Like here I am. This is my tool, right? And so what you choose to do with it at that point is is up to you. Um, it's not officially designed for that, but there are um, there are four holes on the spindle housing here, and there's a port in the back. Um, and so, uh, an air blast accessory, I will say is coming. Um, it's not gonna be available immediately at launch, but, um, this is definitely more of a, a dry machining, um, uh, design. Hopefully that answers that one. And I think we're kind of covering them. Graham, I was going to ask you one, one, one question. Um, yeah, good. uh, what was like, what were the, what comes to mind as some of the early challenges that you had? Um, when you were wrapping your head around designing for CNC? Um. I think it's things like, tw- it's, it's, I think it's mainly tool access and again, and, and, and tool sizes is the first thing because sometimes you'll get a model and it'll have you know, a small draft on it and you won't always notice it. And, and it's the kind of thing you're like, oh yeah, we can machine that. It comes down to it and you think, oh, actually, hang on. I'm looking at my comparison tool. It's telling me that there's something wrong here. Um, and Fusion actually has something called, um, called an accessibility analysis as well. So basically, basically, the whole part either glows green or red. Basically, if it glows red, your tool can't get in there. Um, so, so that's the first thing. And um, so, secondly, again, it's those hard edges. You just it's when you're making the design, you you have to kind of well, that's the kind of the point of this. You need to design with manufacturing in mind, as opposed to the other way around. Like I said, sometimes we want to make the all sing and all dance this most free form thing ever. Like we mentioned before about two setups, that's another thing. You know, it's again, it's another challenge. How do I hold it as soon as I flip this? Yeah. Um, because we do want to make awesome stuff, and with this, with this machine, we can make some awesome stuff. It's just you know you don't want to have, have cut the part and then the first set and think, great, I'm halfway there, only to think, oh yeah, I yeah. need to do other, these other things I should have thought about. Um, so I always think it's, it's a really useful thing. You don't need to be like a, a machining expert, and that's one of the great things about, especially those that that you know, obviously the desktop mill, that kind of bits of kit is that you can kind of have a, a good, an okay level understanding of how machining works. You can apply it to it and you won't make those mistakes. You know, we all make mistakes once or twice. Like I said about tool breaking, I've done it. I, even the most experienced manufacturers, I know do it like, semi-regularly, you know? Um, and, and these are things like that, that happen is, you know, you've got deep pockets. You try to cut too much, for example. It's, it's even thinking along those lines. And as soon as you've kind of given it a go and kind of thrown yourself in the deep end of, you know, sometimes, you know, it's intimidating sometimes to turn your first machine not too long, but because the software and obviously this, lots of the checks and balances, obviously in the software, the Fusion and obviously the Bantam stuff, the machine itself, it'll always give you these warnings. And as soon as you run it a couple of times, like, what was I worried about? You know, yeah. I know these things. And, and yeah, I think that's just always the thing. It's the kind of the hesitation, but there's always, there's no need to hesitate. It's just throw yourself into it and throw yourself into it with a modicum of, you know, appreciation and understanding of how these machine tools work. Right, right. Yeah, I would double down on that message. There's a this this machine is in, in, built with the intention that there's still a low barrier of entry, but uh, quite a high ceiling given sort of the desktop nature. It's still you know forty times faster to forty to I don't know. Maybe I'll play a video that we can go out on really quick. Um, yeah, uh, to awesome. sixty times faster than the PCB mill, which is you know really intended to to mill circuit boards. Uh, sneak peek: this machine also mills circuit boards, um, but. Um, but I think like Graham's saying, you have to get into it. You've got to try and um, through, you know, a first, first, you know, handful of goes at it, you're, you're going to realize some of these conceptual um, things like how do I flip apart? How am I going to work? How am I going, how, how am I going to um, figure out what the work holding is? Because um, 
I think, and I am not this person, but a trained machinist will tell you that like, you know, every time you're running a part, it's a different setup, right? It's always, you're always, every time it's a unique setup to it, to a part. So, um, mm. yeah. Um, let me play one of these. So this is, uh, here in case people have missed this in social, um, Here's a quick look at um, some speeds and feeds testing that I was doing in the shop. Let me put this on. So this is a... Uh, this is um, with a Datron single flute and mill. Um, and just trying to dial in for sort of speed and surface finish. These are all adaptive clearing paths that um, Graham can speak to in two weeks. But this is like the type of thing that I found myself doing a lot when I was first learning is like, how do I get a good, how do I, how do I mill a good pocket? How do I, yeah. how do I machine, you know, a decent wall finish? Um, something that I'm, I'm happy with for the tool and how do I do it quickly? And how does, how does the machine sound? And so this is a lot of stuff that we'll get into next week. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'll hang out in the chat a little bit longer and answer some of these questions. But Graham, thank you so, so much for, for this demo today. Anytime, and if, if you'd like, I'm happy to stay if, if you, you know, if there's anyone, any more questions. Yeah, I think we'll, um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kill the video so we can uh, get a break and drink some water, but we'll, um, you should be able to, to hang out in the chat as well and just and answer some of these questions. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, thanks again, everyone.